Hi, uh, my name is Michael Coughlin. I'm a professor of physics and astronomy here at the University of Minnesota. Hi, and uh, I am Igor Andreoni. I am a postdoctoral fellow at uh, Caltech, and soon I will transition to Joint Space Science Institute at University of Maryland in Goddard, where I will be uh, Neil Guerra's postdoctoral fellow. And we are very excited to introduce to you ZTF REST, which is the pipeline that we use to search SWICKY transient facility data for fast transients in real time. Uh, if for those who are interested, you can see more information in our paper, which is now in press in, in the Astrophysical Journal. Right, so as by way of introduction, um, multi-messenger astronomy has been exploding over the last two years. And so um, with the, the advent of uh, gravitation wave detectors, such as LIGO, Virgo, and CAGRA, um, we are starting to discover many, many gravitation wave sources. In addition to finding binary black holes, we have already started to discover um, binary neutron stars and neutron star black holes. And these are particularly exciting because not only are they gravitation wave sources, but we can also find them in the optical. And so in particular, when we have one of these mergers of these binary neutron stars, not only do they produce gravitation waves, but they also produce kilonovae. And so these are, the optical counterparts to these neutron star mergers produced by the creation of heavy element formation in the merger products um, that we can see with our, the telescopes here on Earth. Um, and this is in addition to uh, a phenomenon known as um, gamma ray bursts, which are what they sound like, where you get um, high energy emission from uh, the matter interacting with the, the surrounding um, interstellar medium post-merger. Next slide. However, finding kilonovae is challenging. Um, kilonovae are, are rare, they're fast, and they're framed. And so many of the existing um, optical surveys are uh, very, very good at detecting what I will call relatively bright and slow transients, like supernovae. Um, however, if you take a look at this plot, you can see that so on the y-axis we have an increasing luminosity and on the x-axis we have um, uh, basically the, the luminosity evolution. And so in black are a number of very common transients and common supernovae. And so you'll see that in general they're reasonably bright and they're reasonably bright over many, many days to months. However, in black here or in red, we show 72017, which is um, one of our quintessential examples of prime neutron star merger. And in particular, you'll notice that uh, it is not only faint, but it is also fading very quickly on the order of just a couple of days. Next slide. I can take over here and say that uh, these events are so rare and so hard to find, even when we know when they happen because of gravitational waves. However, we have now some powerful optical surveys that we can use to try to discover kilonovae, uh, even without any trigger from gamma rays or from gravitational waves. Still, it's a hard job, as uh, Michael Coughlin has just explained. This is why we have developed the ZTFRS pipeline. The objective of the pipeline is to identify very rapidly, uh, within 24 hours approximately, uh, fast evolving transients that could be kilonovae. It is essential that all this work is done in real time so that then we can trigger follow up with uh, other telescopes to take photometry, spectroscopy, multi, uh, multi wavelength data that can help us classify the source and finally uh, find uh, what we're looking for, which is the elusive uh, kilonova transient. And it, this has been a fun journey in that after the pipeline was developed, we started finding a lot of interesting stuff. And only with thorough follow-up, we could understand what all these things were. And it turns out that in some cases, they are indeed interesting transients that unfortunately uh, didn't turn out to be kilonovae. But for example, we found some afterglows of gamma ray bursts, even if we didn't know a priori that the gamma ray burst occurred. Uh, for example, in this case, you can see a beautiful light curve 
that was built with data taken with uh, ZTF, the Zwicky Transit Facility, as well as the uh, Las Cumbres Observatory uh, Worldwide Network, the WASP instrument on, uh, on the 200-inch telescope uh, at Palomar. And uh, while we recognize the transient within only uh, a few, just, just a bit longer than one day from the explosion time, then we could take more data, perform fits, more data analysis, and in particular, we could compare the timing and the location of the transient to all the information we know from uh, gamma ray satellites, such as the Fermi mission. And uh, in, uh, for example, in this case, we believe that uh, we found the afterglow of one specific gamma ray burst. And this afterglow, uh, if indeed the two phenomena are linked, happens so far away from the highest probability region that probably if we were performing standard follow-up, uh, a reactive follow-up of the gamma ray burst, maybe we would have never been able to find it. And so to conclude, uh, unfortunately, we have not been successful in detecting more kilonovi with our pipeline. However, as Igor said, we found a variety of really interesting phenomena, including, including these gamma ray bursts. But one, uh, one benefit that we have, even by not finding more kilonovi, we're able to place very strong upper limits on the rate of these neutron star mergers. This is really complementary information to that provided by the gravitational wave detectors, which have very different selection effects than our optical surveys do. And it's already really informing how many of these we might expect to see in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.